contributions by theorists such as Charles Burnett and Robert C. Solomon, all of whom take up the central challenge of convincing the contemporary reader that a history of sentimentality is worth investigating. Though Burnett's in his doctoral thesis on sentimental media argues that the somewhat respected Dickensian sentimentality of the past can be reclaimed and understood as operating today in the Capra-esque, I depart here and argue on behalf of a more expansive sentimentality capable of existing outside of values of charity, liberal humanism and amato normativity. What's more, Chandler's discussion of the Dickens to D.W. Griffiths to Capra pipeline alongside Burnett's appraisals of it. This is a wild quote. I love reading this one out. Virtuoso craftsman, historical rhetorician and postmodern bricoleur Spielberg raised suspicions that these conceptualizations of sentimentality may not deviate from normative assumptions about what constitutes sentimentality or why emotional art may be socially significant. So without further ado, let's get into a discussion of the plays. Through my research into numerous texts in the Strand, three tiers emerged pertaining to a treatment of characters by their contemporary critics. In the first tier are plays which represent the type of people we are encouraged to empathise with within dominant ideology. Plays where sentimental content centres upon such characters typically avoid being criticised as sentimental. This, I will demonstrate, is the case with Jack Rosenthal's Bar Mitzvah Boy. Texts that fall into this category tend to focus on children or white adults who are not in poverty and are typically co not confrontational with their didacticism. In the second tier, we have characters that do not approximate the type of people we are encouraged to empathise with within dominant ideology. These tend to be characters that are posited as less appropriate recipients of empathy, though critics still report feeling a pull into some sort of empathetic response, which they tend to report as a negative experience. Plays where sentimental content centres on such characters are typically declared sentimental, as is the case for Barry Keefe's Waterloo Sunset. And then, interestingly, we see a kind of curve appear in tier three. This tier centres characters that seemingly cannot be empathised with from within dominant ideology. Sentimental plays which revolve around such characters tend not to be associated with sentimentality, as is the case for Edna the Inebriate Woman. In this instance, critics tend to be hardened to the sentimentality on screen to such a degree that empathetic responses are altogether inhibited rather than seen as disproportionate. In 1971, the Daily Mail's Peter Black espoused poor old Edna, but it's hard to feel sorry. So to begin in tier one, Bar Mitzvah Boy's sentimental treatment of coming of age masculinity was afforded the accolade of kept a degree below sentimentality by the Daily Mail's Sean Usher, be despite featuring high emotion scenes of self-doubt and dissatisfaction at the future's prospects in a world dominated by less than inspiring adult men, reaching far beyond a simple inspection of what it means to grow up and ca catapulting its viewers into a critique of patriarchal relations. Here, it appears evident that children, seen as morally pure and innocent, cannot possibly evoke excess emotion, even when the real source of pathos is the sickness of the world they're inheriting. Somewhat impervious to condemnation despite radical politics, it seems that critics assume that these texts centering on children are easier to defang. Over in tier two is Barry Keefe's Waterloo Sunset. From the Morning Star's Stuart Lane to the Daily Telegraph's Richard Last, writers were taken aback by the piece's alleged sentimentality. Last's reflections on the play are particularly telling, emphasising that, to his mind, the black family at the heart of the play were living on immoral earnings, confirming suspicions about sentimentality denoting empathy for those we are not encouraged to empathise with. This play was also critiqued internally within the BBC for its sentimentality. Graham MacDonald suggested that a very good play had been slightly marred by an element of sentimentality. Protagonist Grace, played by the, formid the formidable Queenie Watts, waits for death in a care home, abandoned by her family with what she refers to as only memories to look forward to. Back in her home, Lambeth, Jeff and Mary Louise struggle with their own abandonment by the father of Mary Louise's children as by society at large, where racially motivated violence is a daily threat. When Grace breaks out of her care home and winds up in a chance encounter with Jeff, helping him get home after being attacked. The play becomes about muddling through difference in the name of race, age and gender, though crucially united by class. Yet, still, love finds its way home. A key source of sentimentality in the play is Grace's invocations of Alf, her late husband. When she states, 
He was going to change the world, my Alf. Change like he never meant. I just played the piano. Her nostalgia is tinged with a sense of regret, a deep pain that she tries to reason away or laugh at. But it appears evident that the emotion evoked here, tangential to the central narrative, is intrinsically bound to the sorry state of her own self-perception and the limitations she places on what she could achieve, who she could be. Here, the assumed space of comfort becoming uncomfortable is the self. As she laments, I just played the piano, the camera slowly pans to an extreme close-up of part of her face, creating a kind of intimacy with her. But, crucially, we do not see all of her, not even half of her face. We are afforded, in this moment, only a snapshot of her self-perception, of what she deems important about herself, which is crucially lacking. Sentimentality allows, in the play, for a kind of self-reflexivity to flourish, Viewers are encouraged to feel rather than merely reflect upon how Grace's anguish moves her to languish, to feel how overpowering her feelings are when closeness is ripped apart at the seams after years characterised by its absence. At the end of the play, when the family are broken apart by brute force and the violence of policing and incarceration, we perceive her helplessness and in the immobility of sadness when confronted with it, we may perceive our own too. The play reminds us that Grace is one woman, The mass incarceration of black people in Britain is applied far beyond her individual reach. In these final moments, her helplessness demonstrates the ludicrousness of white saviour narratives and the feebleness of resistance that centres on conditional care for marginalised individuals rather than ideological commitment to systemic change. Through an interrogation of the play's use of sentimentality, it becomes evident that pain immobilises and burns us out without a debt channelling and direction of it. Sentimentality in Waterview Sunset is thus neither an exercise in providing the gratifying experience Plantigia supposed the mode would offer, nor does it reify the definitive code of a society now inspired by ideologies of family and domestic contentment, as Burnett suggests. The latter sentiment is not least resisted because Grace ends the play receiving exactly all that she desires at the play's very beginning, the care of her son, which proves itself to be a hollow and unsatisfactory desire. I would suggest instead that, in the words of Walter Benjamin, it provides a resensitizing experience. Now I wish to move on to a play where sentimentality is not picked on, picked up on by critics due to an inability to see the protagonist as someone to empathize with at all. A work in the third tier. Edna the Inebriate Woman is an example of this where critics laid bare their prejudices with glee. T.C. Worsley in the Financial Times admitted that he felt that it's hard to feel sorry for a grubby old woman, much harder than a younger, good-looking one. Concluding that Sandford's film went over the miserable truth that these sad old people with their wandering, their drinking, their outbursts of unreasoning violence, their disconnected minds, are inadequately cared for mostly because they are too troublesome and difficult to communicate with. Likewise, Philip Purser for the Sunday Telegraph revealed To be honest, two-fifths of why I dislike the works of Jeremy Sanford is bad conscience. Bad conscience. He cares about the homeless and the feckless and the down and outs I'd sooner ignore. My own textual analysis decidedly places Edna the inebriate woman within the sentimental mode. Emotion is extrapolated from highly charged scenes tangential to the subject matter of the play, which Jeremy Sanford outlines as investigating the role of the small permissive hostel in society. Many of the sentimental moments explore Edna's struggle to define her self-perception, exemplified by her courtroom cries of, I am not a vagrant. Her resistance to infantilization by nurses is another source of emotional heights. Watching sedated Edna watch a younger woman dance provides a potentially painful viewing experience. She She turns to the camera, almost looking directly into the lens as if to search us for help. And then we see Edna extend her own empathy towards the girl, wishing her a short stay on the psychiatric ward. She marches on. Finally, I wish to talk about fourth play, Trevor Griffith's All Good Men. In doing so, I hope to establish some of the boundaries of this new definition of sentimentality, to portray its outer limits and establish its potential to defy pre-existing definitions. Associating this work with the sentimental mode in ways that may appear more surprising still, given historic associations with the term. All Good Men, as much of Griffith's work, is typically understood to be didactic renowned for its dialectical nature and writerly focus, thought of as within the realm of ideas rather than feelings. The play maintains a kind of stealth tier one status, if you like, where the emotions are not so much committed as never even truly registered. 
I argue that the case can be made for its existence within the sentimental mode, operating within it to its advantage. The Strand's own Dennis Potter, writing in The New Statesman, demonstrates an ignorance to the play sentimentality, determining it as, determining it as almost too unsentimental, too singularly didactic. The acclaimed play for today writer protests that people have more than their opinions and that the play was too singularly focused on the politics it explored, reformist party politics within Labour versus Marxism. He claimed that All Good Men is only about what it's about, the opposite of sentimentality, which always offers narratively tangential emotion. Here, Potter fails to appreciate the way that the play not only provides comprehensive insights into the two political positions he acknowledges, but also exemplifies how political commitment can be a lonely experience, isolating someone from those closest to them as worldviews collide and communication breaks down. In the midst of the father-son argument on screen, the sister intervenes, he's ill, Christ, do you want to kill him? As the pair fight, impassioned. She runs off screen crying, retorting, damn you both, demonstrating emotion that may be seen as surplus to the central arguments orbiting the play. Why add this interaction, this familial grounded aspect of the play, if not to craft something beyond a simple back and forth of two perspectives? Sentimentality becomes an aesthetic intervention in the text, which illustrates a family's tears at the seams, engendered by urgent debates which are not taking place in a vacuum, or a political forum for that matter. This dimension of the play elucidates the importance of the argument, even to those it inflicts most intensely. The content of the argument itself is emotional too. Tearing into his father's voting record, the Marxist son states, if you call that being for the minors, by Christ, I hope you never side with me. Michael Tanner objects to sentimentality on the grounds that it doesn't lead anywhere. I put forth the argument that sentimentality is both a destination in itself and also as a subsidiary impact can lead us in many directions, not least significantly towards each other. I propose that sentimentality can operate in new ways beyond simple identification, pity, charitable impulse, pleasantness or directionless catharsis into a realm of countering alienation, supplementing understanding of a text, clarifying the inadequacy of borders previously patrolled in media studies, such as the realist versus melodramatic binary, the one between didacticism and emotion, the political versus the personal or the feminine, and even wider social binaries like thinking versus feeling, logic and reason versus emotion and expression. Sentimentality in play for today often appears to operate as an intermediary between affect and empathy, and as such a valuable step in processing pathos for one another, and when used in a way conducive to challenging orthodoxy, a lubricant for the invocation of solidarity. At the Royal Academy this year, Francis Bacon was described as wanting his paintings to have an immediacy that activated the senses ahead of conscious understanding, to unlock the vows of feeling, and therefore to turn the onlooker to life more violently. Walter Benjamin claims that a state of shock has become the norm, stating that under conditions of modern technology, the aesthetic system undergoes a dialectical reversal. The human sensorium changed from a mode of being in touch with reality into a means of blocking out reality. The sentimental mode retrieves aesthetic potential from beyond that which has failed the 20th and 21st centuries repeatedly. What if the valves of feeling open to something more expansive? Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, loads of interesting issues raised there and look forward to discussing them further in the Q&A. That was great. Thank you so much for a, a brilliant start. Um, we'll go next to Spiros Caretis, and we have Spiros is uh, going to discuss when Greek television studies, brackets, never close brackets, met the audiences, how fans respond to popular old television comedies on YouTube. As Spiros holds a DPhil in Media and Cultural Studies from the University of Oxford. He has published on Greek LGBTQI plus cinema and television, genre studies and autoethnography. He is the author of Greek television comedy, popular text, queer readings, and he's currently teaching television and media studies at the Faro Creative Learning in Athens, Greece. Over to you, Spiros. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to say that that was my mistake. The book is not uh, uh, available yet, but it's forthcoming within 2022. Uh, so good morning. Hey, uh, Sorry, um, I cannot see your PowerPoint at the moment for some reason. I can only see your, your screen sharing, but you're not sh sharing PowerPoint. Right. Let me see again. 
What about the one? No. Anyone else having the same problem? Maybe it's just me. No, you can't see it either. I can't see it. No. Let me, let me try again. What about now? Mm, nope. Still the same problem. Yeah. Only. I'm afraid that this might be a problem with the internet connection. Okay. Do you do you wanna are you quite happy to just talk as well, like Katie did? Yeah, I could do that. The thing is that you know I have I just have some comments which are available. That's from YouTube. So would it be possible, you know, to send it to you and present perhaps later? Yeah, um shall we shall we um shift to Jen next then instead of oh, Thank you very yeah? much. Right. Okay, I like this freestyling. So we're going over to Jen, if you're ready. Um, she, uh, Jen is speaking about It's All Right, Saved by the Bell, an American teen sitcom and British broadcasting. And Jen McLeavy is a postgraduate researcher at the University of Exeter, working on a thesis about the use of American sitcom in British broadcasting. She's editor in chief of Network Knowledge, the Journal of the Mexico Postgraduate Network and works in the television industry. Over to you, Jen. Thank you. This is part of my thesis um, and across the bigger historical view of American sitcom and British television, there's a, a strong theme of utility. Sitcoms are used because they're useful to broadcasters. And this is particularly true of the subgenre I'm focused on today. So kind of to start, what is a teen sitcom? Uh, from, from my purposes, I've defined it in two sub, a, a subgenre of two parts. First, it's a form of domestic sitcom where adolescent characters are at the core of the situation. They are generally produced for prime time with a target audience that is kind of full family viewing. Uh, this category kind of dates back to the 1950s and has developed as teen identity developed in society. The growth of, the, of this subgenre reflects an economic change. Adolescent, adolescent and teen audiences were being addressed directly because they were seen as an increasingly important consumer group. Uh, they reflected consumer culture where teens could escape to the mall free from parental supervision and with their own money to spend. The success of primetime teen sitcoms and increasing awareness of the teen buying power would lead to, to the second part of the teen sitcom definition, the daytime teen sitcom. These were removed from a domestic situation, had minimal, minimal adult presence on screen. The first of these was NBC's Saved by the Bell, which will be examined in more detail shortly. Unlike earlier teen sitcoms, these were generally produced to be shown outside of prime time. They were added to children's television blocks, often serving to bridge the end of cartoons and the start of daytime television in weekend programs. While primetime teen sitcoms aim to address the entire family, daytime teen sitcoms were only intended for the younger audience. Parents were rarely seen on screen, and any adult voice, such as Saved by the Bell's principal, principal Belding, was more often a point of ridicule than of moral guidance. These sitcoms also minimized locations, even beyond that of other sitcoms, and were comparatively cheap and quick to produce as a result. With no seriality beyond the aging of the actors, episodes could also be played in almost any order, making them easy to schedule and to sell in syndication. The dialogue used was simple with readability indices of sample dialogue placing the text at a reading age of eight years old. It's also a subgenre defined by its intended audience. While the primetime sitcom placed viewing within the family, the Daytime teen sitcom anticipates that no present, no parent is present for the viewing, or at least not as an active participant in the viewing. As such, the two sitcoms overlap, but there's a fairly clear line between the two. And despite this audience-based construct, it must be noted, as discussed by Glenn Davis and Kay Dickinson, all of these programs are the products of adults. So while daytime teen sitcoms appeal to teens, they walk a careful line to maintain an ethical agenda. They're intensely focused on maintaining social norms 
and aimed at a younger audience than typical sitcoms. They often depict an idealized high school location with archetypal characters fitting into the set dichotomies of jock, nerd, preppy alternative, popular, unpopular, etc. So while scholarly attention has been given to teen television as a whole, there's relatively little that engages with teen sitcoms. Teen dramas have been addressed more widely and with particular attention given to specific programs, and mostly in as much as they stand out as exemplary in spite of their audience. Similarly, networks have been profiled for the way they are directed at teens. Where teen sitcoms have been addressed, it tends to be cursory and used as a passing example for a larger focus of, top of another topic, such as portrayal of teachers, friendships, same-sex desire, race, and by and large, they're considered significant only in, in the way they relate to something else that's more worthy of scholarly attention. However, these programs are significant in their own right, and it's important to see them as that. They, they informed a, ch a changing approach to scheduling, served a growing audience that expected to be direct to, to be directly addressed, and were produced with marketability in mind. They uh, they recognize that the teen audience of this era has alternative op entertainment options available. The availability of video game consoles and the internet began to fracture family viewing, as did ever lower costs for, uh, for additional television sets. The networks ran the risk of having their most profitable demographics leaving television viewing altogether. So teen sitcoms are a way of retaining viewers and mix of style within the subgenre allowed for a wide, as wide an audience as possible to be reached. So, <laughs> Saved by the Bell. It, in July 1987, NBC premiered a pilot called, for a sitcom called Good Morning Miss Bliss. Critics uniformly hated it. It was thinly written, humorless, and starring Haley Mills, whose charm is the only thing mentioned that's positive in, in descriptions of it. Disney Channel ordered the series from NBC, who would produce up to 80 episodes for around $250,000 to $300,000 per episode. Disney Channel would broadcast one episode per week, paying NBC a per episode fee. After the first window, NBC would have rights to re-air it on Saturday mornings or during summer. Additionally, it could be sold to local stations through Disney's distribution arm, Buena Vista, with Disney paying NBC a one-off fee for rerun rights, thus sidestepping FCC rules that had barred NBC, ABC, and CBS from sharing syndication sales. When the series premiered in November 1988, with the slightly revised plot and no actors remaining apart from Mills, it still received negative reviews. By January 1989, Disney had decided not to renew the series beyond its initial 13-episode run. However, it is worth noting that while Disney were plan to drop the series, they did take the 13 episodes that were available to the Monte Carlo Television Festival as one of the titles available to buy from Buena Vista. However, NBC continued, decided to continue the production of the series, gave it the new title of Safe by the Bell, and without, without Haley Mills, who was under contract to Disney. Uh, this new series uh, premiered in August 1989. It began to, to work well for NBC, allowing it to reach beyond its usual two to 11 year old audience for a Saturday morning television block. When it was brought to the 1991 Monte Carlo Television Festival, it, uses, it was used as, as an exemplary case of how to reach niche demographics in an increasingly segmented market. NBC International's Gary Wald explained that buying content for the, and this is a quote, hard to reach but much sought after teenage demographic was less costly and could gain better ratings among targeted viewers by giving them something other than animation or music videos. The success was further heralded in a three-page advertising spread calling the show America's Best Kept Sitcom Secret. Here the program was being sold to local channels in syndication, offering Monday to Friday stripping success in more than half of the US and appealing to a wide audience, as the, as the ad copy here, shown here is touts. By 1992, Saved by the Bell was airing in 34 countries and was in, as inspiration for a raft of other similar sitcoms produced by Peter Engel about good-looking teenage, teenagers and their not-too-troubling daily lives. By 1996, NBC's entire Saturday schedule had moved to live action. When the original set of characters 
graduated from Bayside High in 1992. It wasn't the end of the road. A spin-off TV film, Saved by the Bell, Hawaiian style, was released in November 1982, with NBC Productions' John Ogolia saying, you can't look at this like a regular series that goes on and off. We're looking at this as a franchise. A new version, Saved by the Bell, the new class, was quickly followed by Saved by the Bell, the college years, which reunited the original cast at the fictional California University, and another TV movie, Saved by the Bell, Wedding in Las Vegas. Gogli's view that this was a franchise, not a program, was quickly came to fruition. From the start, it was created to be resold, both in domestic syndication and to international markets. The, con the NBC series was sold internationally almost as soon as it pr had premiered, and the concept of it being a way to capture elusive and potentially lucrative audience was appealing to broadcasters around the world. In the UK, Saved by the Bell was first run on Channel 4 in January 1993, having been bought by newly appointed commissioning editor Lucinda Whiteley. The success of, of Save by the Bell allowed Whiteley to commission a UK teen drama, Hollyoaks, which was described in broadcast in 1995 as Saved by the Bell's British counterpart and to, and to buy in more teen-oriented imports. While Saved by the Bell had paved the way for more teen-oriented programming, it didn't have universal appeal and still has a, a, a negative a negative view of quality, um, as, as is shown by the second quote from Jacques Peretti. Andrew Pulver, writing in The Guardian, describes it as having in five short years spawned its own mini industry. The, indus the industrial view of the program is quite valid. After all, it had been developed under an agreement that fundamentally changed how network production arms viewed buying markets, was created with international sales in mind, and was redeveloped as an anchor for a sea change in what Saturday morning kids television meant. In the UK, it took, way, it took hold in a way that none of its successors could. After all, the scale of the mini-industry was impressive. 13 episodes plus a pilot of Good Morning Miss Bliss, 86 episodes of Saved by the Bell, 19 episodes of Saved by the Bell, The College Years, two made-for-TV movies, two hours each, 143 episodes of Saved by the Bell, The New Class, and 10 episodes of Saved by the Bell 2020, with another 10 in production. The televisual output was full, further bolstered by an aggressive marketing campaign with a wide range of merchandise available, including novelizations for any for sale in any territory where the program aired. So when we look at the way that Saved by the Bell travels to other territories, it's, it's, it's reflective of the genre as a whole. The, the teen sitcoms are notable in their spread outside of the US and this may be, due, may be due to the kind of fundamental parts of it. It was simple language, minimal idioms. It often they often rely on visual humor, which makes them more easily translatable in other languages and within other markets. It, for the UK, the sitcoms fueled a period of high American sitcom imports. They, as in the US, the target audience for teen sitcoms, both primetime and daytime, was developing into a more independent demographic with its own spending patterns. While the BBC did offer some teen sitcom, by the late 90s nearly all teen sitcom was scheduled by commercial broadcasters. American teen programs were used by a number of British channels, particularly as broadcast hours expanded in the 80s and 90s. Terrestrial broadcasters tended to follow the way the programs had been had been scheduled in the US and generally placed them in at the end of tele children's television blocks. But while British teen programming allowed broadcasters to direct programming to an underserved demographic, they also provided a type of utility that harkened back to the to earlier eras of British television. Primetime teen sitcoms could offer broadcaster an assurance of quality and longevity based on the American performance. And the daytime teen sitcoms offered flexibility for scheduling. They could be played out in any order and they had longer series runs so it could be strip scheduled. They, were, they could also be dropped in at different times of the day, which meant they could be used to patch smaller holes in schedules, such as between films, live sport, and other anchors to a day's schedule. Teen sitcoms also offered a relatively cheap and easy schedule filler for terrestrial channels, but they became key to satellite and cable channels that aimed at an older youth audience. Disney, Nickelodeon, and Trouble all offered an expanded list of teen sitcoms to audiences. In these cases, they were not just used in a utilitarian way, but as a way of self-definition. The brand awareness was a way of drawing audiences into the channels and keeping them there. 
while the terrestrial scheduling had been aimed at a replication of the pre presumed domestic ideal, the growth of children's television channels targeted the opposite. They were intended to be the only channel needed for the younger view for viewing of younger family members. There was no need to bounce between channels in search of a program you might like. They were all waiting for you in a single place all day long. Uh, launched by, in 1997 by Virgin Media, Trouble was aimed at a teen, young adult audience. Disney and Nickelodeon were largely populated by the content produced for their American counterparts, and from the outset they were identified by the success of their American versions. They made no claims to Britishness, instead appealing to an audience's desire to connect to the content available in America. Disney and Nickelodeon shared a mix of, of cartoons and teen sitcoms throughout the day. While Disney aimed to appeal to the entire family through its schedule, uh, with gradually older skewing programs as the day went on, Nickelodeon was just for kids. There was no expectation that older audiences would continue viewing. While Disney looked to retain audiences throughout their throughout the day, Nick took the approach that it aimed to re retain kids throughout their childhood, after which time, as older teens, they would presumably move from Nickelodeon to one of the sister channels owned by Viacom, either MTV or Paramount Comedy. Trouble didn't offer that same mix. And as you can see on the screen, there's a that's a, a day's schedule of trouble. Um, it was all it was entirely teen oriented programming. It, it had a block of young adult soaps, a mix of Australian and UK programs. And but most of the schedule is American sitcoms. So everything green is American and it's some form of a teen sitcom. Disney and Nickelodeon mirrored the sister channels in the US and they worked on the economy that they were, it was a second window of content that had been produced for the US. So money was saved by, by having cross-territory broadcast. Trump, but you, looking at trouble, American sitcoms filled the schedules in a demographically focused way. They rely on teen sitcoms, demonstrating that the audience was the, the intended audience was teens. It was classed as a kids channel, but with content distinctly aimed at older kids and young adults. Much of the schedules program featured teen protagonists, the majority of the programs originally produced for kids, kids teen programming in the US. Trouble schedules reflect a low cost approach to viewer retention across a day and across an age range. Daytime programs were not shifted to preschool content as as was the case in Disney and Nickelodeon. Instead, they offered a mix of younger skewing soaps and sitcoms. This was a channel for adolescents, teen and young adults to turn to when they wanted easy television that could entertain all day. There were no attention demanding dramas, which may have been a reflection of the split attentions of their target audience. Trouble could be kept on on your own television in your bedroom while you did things like go on the Internet, talk to friends on your mobile phone or even do homework. The success of these teen sitcoms is evidenced by the continued presence in schedules on, and on streaming platforms. Disney and Nickelodeon continue to have network identities linked to easily consumed teen sitcoms. While other sitcoms have evolved over time, the genre of teen sitcom has stayed remarkably stable. The legacy of these sitcoms isn't just in their continued presence though. Media use by adolescents in the 1990s was increasingly used to define identity. The presence of channels devoted to this audience and the adolescent audience's growing ability to watch them without parental interruption potentially had a longer term impact on the audience's viewing habits. It becomes important that these channels offered such a significant amount of American sitcom. In addition to the immediate reasons for the use of these programs, long series run, little seriality, low import costs, there was potentially a long lasting effect. As late 1990s adolescent adult audiences reached an age where it was defining its identity through media consumption, the dedicated loci for that consumption was, were offering schedules that were almost entirely American sitcoms. It's possible to conclude that this would have had an impact on the identity formation, setting the British adolescent audience of this era to be more receptive to American sitcoms as they aged. This locating of American sitcoms may also have a disproportional impact on later schedules. Adolescence is recognized as a time where identity is defined, particularly in relation to media consumption. As David Bell's notes, it's arguably the most significant period of lifespan when it comes to media psychology. 
Giles, writing in, in 2003, further draws attention to these and other channels dedicated solely to teen-oriented programming, including younger presenters and characters that are aimed squarely at the teenage and younger adult audience. If an adolescent and teen audiences in the late 1990s were being directed to American sitcom, it would follow that their tolerance for American sitcom in schedules may be higher than previous generations. While this would not be the sole influence, particularly as the internet began to chip away at cultural borders with file sharing websites allowing for unauthorized trade of music, films and television, it does offer context for changes to UK broadcasting landscape that would occur in the early 2000s. While it's not possible at this stage to do a scientifically rigorous study on the impact of these programs on viewers from the late 90s, and whether the presence of these sitcoms in the 90s would directly influence viewer tolerance for American sitcoms, it is possible to see that they did have some influence on programming. The location of American sitcoms in this era gives some insight into the larger changes to broadcasting in the era. While debates around content of what could or should be on Channel 5 were mounting, the growth of, of satellite channels was beginning to establish the practice of narrow casting with separate channels set up to appeal to different interests and demographics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. That was really, really interesting. And with two teenagers myself, it was just fascinating learning about the sort of formation and the inception of like teen focused TV, especially with the US influences. So that was great. Thank you. And again, we'll discuss it more, I'm, I'm sure, in the Q&A. Thank you. OK, so should we go with Matthew or Spiros, Elka? Who, whoever you want to go first. Right. Uh, Matthew, should we go with you next? Yeah, let's go I, with me. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. So OK, so um, Matthew is from the University of Glasgow and he's going to be speaking about constructing a history of television from precarious archives with the Edinburgh International TV Festival. He's in his second year of doctoral research at the University of Glasgow, constructing a history of the Edinburgh International Television Festival and the MacTaggart Lectures. Thank you, Matthew. Sure, I'll take it away. So, as we've just heard, I am Matthew Floyd, second year researcher at the University of Glasgow. <clears throat> In this paper, I'll address the use of primary sources to understand the big stories of television histories in relation to my doctoral research on the history of the Edinburgh International Television Festival, henceforth the EITBF, as it approaches its 50th anniversary in 2026. Uh, as a researcher based in the UK, uh, barriers to access have been a recurring and ongoing concern throughout the lifespan of this project with regards particularly to the pandemic. Archive access has long been the subject of scholarly scrutiny in constructing television histories and COVID has greatly exacerbated many existing issues. As such, this will be a major recurring theme throughout this talk and moreover how my research design has developed to incorporate and overcome these challenges. In doing so, this paper will examine the precarious nature of television and festival histories in relation to the particularities of the EITVF primary sources. Slide, please. Elke. Sorry, it's slide. not move. It's not moving for some reason. Um, I have no idea why. Let me. It's uh, all right. It's not urgent. When it catches up, it catches up. Hold on. Let me try again. Um. Oh, now I've closed it. No use. OK, uh, you keep talking and I'll, I'll crack on. Do. Sure. Uh, the title of my thesis is How the Industry Speaks to Itself, Constructing a History of Television through the McTaggart Lectures and the EITVF Archive. It's a collaborative doctoral award between Glasgow Uni and the TV Foundation, which is the charitable division of the festival aimed at supporting the industry and uh, more recently building bridges between industry and academia. Uh, Amy Holdsworth and Lisa Kelly are my supervisors at Glasgow Uni and I'm working with the managing director Campbell Glenny of the festival. So uh, given the range of topics represented in the panel uh, before I more specifically outline the research context methods and sources of the project, uh, here's a bit of background on the festival. As its website notes, uh, the festival is one of the most prestigious media events in the UK. As a television festival, it is the leading UK event and this is in the context of the domestic and global scarcity of television festivals in comparison with the abundance of film festivals, especially here in Glasgow. Uh, the international element of the title reflects both the participation of global broadcasting practitioners 
and the significance of British broadcasting to the rest of the world in terms of exports, adaptable formats and pioneering works. In its present form, yeah, that's, that's the right slide, thanks. Uh, in its present form, it takes place in Edinburgh in August each year, uh, spanning three days and uh, offering more than 60 keynotes, debates and masterclasses, plus scores of networking opportunities, drawing around 2,200 professionals from across the globe. In 2020 and 2021, the pandemic pushed the festival into a temporary digital form with approximately the same structure. This year, it returns to its physical form, uh, and as it surmises, uh, the festival is famous for its provocative, informative and entertaining sessions, all created by seasoned TV producers, ensuring they are of the highest quality and relevance. Slide, please. So the um, James McTaggart Memorial Lecture is the festival's keynote address and has formed the centerpiece of it since 1976, uh, when it was founded. Uh, the lecture was named in honour of the Glasgow-born writer, producer and director James McTaggart, who was a pioneering, idealistic and disruptive force in British broadcasting. True to the man himself, the lecture quickly became a hugely important platform for policy announcements and agenda setting speeches. And on the slide there, uh, you can see a panel list of the recent past speakers and immediately you might see uh, how the historical significance of the lectures might snowball. Uh, this year they have not announced the speaker yet, uh, but last year it was the prolific screenwriter and playwright uh, Jack Thorne who used the podium to spotlight the neglect of people with disabilities on and off screen in television and film and indeed wider society with particularly disastrous impact during Covid. Uh, the McTaggart lectures function as a one hour slot each year with the potential power to shift industry and cultural conversations provoking headlines, talking points and potential policy shifts. My research is original in that the festival and indeed its keynote speech have been of minimal formal academic attention. And some of the reasons for this will be addressed uh, both in my research and in this presentation. A uh, slide, please. So in comparison with the well-established field of film festival studies, scholarship on television festivals has been minimal. There have been some short studies of specific festivals, so the focus in this research has been on the business side of festival ac activity as media industry events operating primarily as marketplaces. The only academic book on the Edinburgh Festival is Bob Franklin's collection, Television Policy, the McTaggart Lectures, which collates the lectures, uh, heavily edited versions of them, until 2004 with an analytical introductory chapter, but no sustained analysis of the speeches themselves. So in designing the project, the managing director, Campbell Glenny, uh, identified a specific archive of festival materials that the organisation wishes to use in order to construct both the history of the festival and to position it within a broader history of telly. Uh, the research project uh, is therefore designed to use the McTaggart's as its central corpus alongside additional digitised materials of the speeches and debates which feature in the festival each year to construct this history and to address a set of broader questions regarding television historiography, the role and function of a television festival, and the possibilities of collaboration between academy and industry. So the archive should allow me to trace a history of television through the McTaggart Lectures annual snap snapshot of industry with each speech addressing the hot topics facing television as an industry and as an artistic and cultural force. However, while the archive hypothetically constitutes previously unexplored cultural site through which this history can be written, access to this unexplored cultural site has been significantly hindered by the pandemic and other factors. Slide please. Uh, so when I submitted my proposal for this paper at the beginning of the year, I was looking a lot into methodology and how other researchers had approached uh, comparable institutional production and festival histories. Discussions of television histories within television studies have quite, reason quite reasonably commonly referred to archives as pertaining to programmes as the primary sources in question. These bring with them a wide array of challenges in preservation, storage, documentation and access as summarised by Messenger Davies in their article, Heirlooms in the Living Room. Ostensibly, uh, leading concerns are the ephemerality of material due to being variously pre-video, broadcast live or since lost, alternatively blocked by rights issues, overwhelmed by the sheer volume of potential materials, challenged by uh, questions of economic and cultural value, and indeed questions over what exactly constitutes television to be archived. 
Now, this short list alone is far from comprehensive, but gives us a useful overview of the core issues challenging archives of television histories. To contextualize my project's added dimension of telling these histories not directly through the small screen, but through a festival with its own distinct history, I have been looking to researchers' experiences in building film festival histories from comparable archives. Slide, please. So uh, film festival studies as its own defined field has really only developed in the 21st century, meaning that the subject area is still grappling with approaching its own past. One of the field's most pioneering scholars is Marika de Valk, who has consistently made the case for recognizing festival histories as essential to understanding their present and futures. Uh, so in their landmark 2006 thesis, uh, film festivals, history and theory of European phenomenon that became a global network, de Valk examined the methodological approach to the study of festivals. I quote, uh, taking film festivals as a new object for historical research is not without its difficulties. Film festivals are transient events of which the intensity and activity is only partly represented in festival catalogues, newspaper reports and media coverage. Like research after early cinema, the study of festivals beckons a careful reconsideration of what counts as historical evidence. Uh, they continue, the prerequisite for thick historical description is an extensive, well-kept and accessible festival archive that may be complemented by information derived from oral history. When such an ideal archive is missing, the film historian is forced to explore other forms of historiography." End quote. Here, Devalk references the inherent nature of festivals as problematic for archival practices. While they may be distinct transient events, in contrast with year-round television programming, they nonetheless produce an intense and disparate spread of materials across marketing, media and journalism at the very least, which is to ignore the networking connections and corridor conversations that are key to a festival's vitality. To build an accurate collage of festival histories is to attempt to knit together these great many formal and informal sources that are produced internally and externally of the festival. Well, in a previous conference paper, I addressed the challenges of building this collage while the pandemic prevented access to the festival archive. I began my research in October 2020, and, and indeed it wasn't until the end of October 2021, 13 months later, that I was able to finally visit the office where the archive is housed. Additionally, uh, access was inherently limited by the geographical distance from my Glasgow-based research uh, to the London-based archive uh, and the administrative and financial implications thereof. So in the remainder of this paper, I'm going to discuss my engagement with the archive itself and how my findings reflect the challenges of the precarious nature of festival management and the vast changes in technology that the festival's history has overseen. Furthermore, as per Devalk's discussion of the prerequisites for a thick historical description of a festival's history, uh, which I will address through incorporating an oral, oral history as a core element of my methodology. So what's in the archive? Slide, please. Until October 2021, the only documentation I had indicating what was preserved in the archive came from two spreadsheets that were shared with me, which paint far from a full picture. First, an inventory spreadsheet that was compiled in 2019 by a temporary staff member outside of the organizational team's core event production duties. The inventory, which you can see here, is both vast and incomplete. That's only a segment of it. Uh, with the earliest listed material being Troy Kennedy Martin's 1986 McTaggart, while the most recent is Lord Burt's 2005 McTaggart. This spreadsheet raises many questions that it answers. For example, are the pre-1986 lectures available at all? What about the rest of the programmes? What is the precise nature of the general cassette format listed? How the archive has been organised physically and so on. Slide, please. Subsequently, a more complex, detailed and comprehensive inventory was shared with me that points to a more rigorous and sustained archival practice. This goes back early to 1983. However, this still leaves seven earlier years completely unaccounted for. This storage log is particularly interesting, not only for the volume of documentation, but what it indicates about shifting archival practices over time. Technological developments are a core issue in both television history and archival practices. And from this log, you can see how the earliest recordings would be stretched over multiple cassettes, which still remains an ambiguous catch-all term in these spreadsheets for the recording format. Uh, these two documents indicate some of the challenges I would face upon gaining access to the archive, changes in recording and preservation technology and strategies, and the rapid turnover of festival staff 
underpinning the precarity of the archive. Indeed, these factors manifested upon finally visiting the office to explore the archive. Now, concurrent with the ongoing gradual lessening of pandemic related restrictions, my intention was to visit the archive as soon as possible following the 2021 online festival, uh, which was uh, the end of August that year. However, the seasonal nature of festival work, whereby the size and responsibilities of the organizational staff increases towards and climaxes at the festival, the team were taking a well-earned break over September to reflect on and recover from the festival. Uh, and this and other commitments resulted in the end of October 2021 being the earliest possible window to gain access. A slide, please. Now, approximately two weeks ahead of this, the office manager, Cassia, who incidentally uh, was a pandemic hire, so she had never been into the office herself, despite being the office manager, until this initial appraisal <laughs> of the archive. So uh, Cassia offered me um, the following description of the archive by email. Uh, quote, I've now been in the office and managed to have a look in our storage at our archives and can confirm that while it's all a bit of a mess, we have lots of photos, press clippings and CDs of the session spanning back to the 90s at least, although I doubt it's comprehensive and it'll take a while to sort through. One of my goals uh, is to actually get it into order and digitise it though, and this will obviously be a long term project, end quote, which was interesting because that's also one of the core intentions of my project. Uh, it's a very ambitious intention. Uh, the bit of a mess that I was anticipating correlates with Messenger Davies' discussion of the problem of changing formats and the challenges of what out of the sheer volume of potential materials over a near 50 year history is kept. Slide, please. Uh, in her 2020 chapter, uh, researcher Heather L. Barnes addressed the challenges of investigating again film festivals from her from a historical perspective. Barnes here expands upon Devout's notion of an ideal archive as its manifestation as traces of the festival, which are defined broadly as any physical or digital output that has a lifespan beyond the event itself. Whatever traces remain can be used in substantiating the event's historiography. However, Barnes also refers to the key limitations to creating and maintaining such an archive, staff, space and expertise. All three of these limiting factors were apparent when I encountered the precise nature of the festival's archive, the mess that it was, as Cassio had described it, on the 26th of October 2021. As Barnes considers, festivals typically have just a few full-time employees and rely heavily on temporary volunteers. This combined with the annual seasonal nature of work makes October very much out of season and the more recent pandemic restrictions making on-site working in a negative trend. So the office at this time was very much managed by a rotating skeleton crew, both out of uh, necessity of work and safety. Um, and incidentally, while this was my first engagement with the Onsite Archive, it wouldn't be until March this year, 2022, that I actually even met my industry supervisor in person. And even then, that was a chance meeting. I was there to see someone else. Uh, that said, a quiet office actually enabled a higher degree of freedom to pull boxes out and rifle through. Uh, and as a first engagement, uh, the lack of on-site staff was on the whole beneficial. Uh, and those who were present were extremely accommodating and particularly my questions about what the coffee system was. Uh, slide, please. While limitations of staff, uh, space and expertise are all manifested, uh, naturally conditions of space were the most prominent upon physical archive access. Whatever preconceptions one has about uh, an ideal archiving practice had been afforded a handful of salt through the prior spreadsheets and literature review of comparable histories. Upon access, what was deemed the archive constituted three primary spaces in a modern office complex. The first and most important, in fact, being essentially a large cupboard by the fire escape, which you had to access uh, by walking through the company next door. Tellingly, uh, the light in the storage space did not work, uh, though this is where the majority of materials resided. Uh, this dusty back room housed both valuable artifacts and unclaimed marketing freebies in equal measure and also the company Christmas tree. A second, a large upright filing cabinet in the center of the office, which housed historical materials of many kinds, some of which were similarly purely novel, such as arts and crafts trinkets. Uh, and third, a promised offsite lockup in stains, uh, the contents of which nobody was quite sure of. 
Uh, the third limitation of archiving expertise was evident here. Without a dedicated practice, preservation of materials was inconsistent and eclectic, making for a great fascination and discovery in my examination. And accordingly, I spent the week exploring and sorting through uh, for what was to be prioritised for study and digitisation, uh, surmounting the, the challenges of which will endure the duration of my PhD and almost definitely beyond. Uh, slide, please. Given the precarity of the Festival Archive as my central corpus, uh, I'm going to supplement it with all the histories from key participants towards building a thick historical description of the EITVF's history. Uh, these key participants will, will chiefly be the lecturers themselves, alongside core decision-making figures from the festival team, such as past managing and creative directors and advisory chairs, uh, who uh, collaboratively oversee uh, the selection of, of McTaggart lecturers and sort of guide their process of writing the speeches. Uh, this correlates with what Selden and Patworth have referred to as elite oral history, the process of asking questions and gathering information from those who forged or witnessed events in history. Indeed, throughout the 21st century, all history studies of television have become increasingly prominent, partially motivated by the potential loss of artifacts and personnel through the passage of time. Slide, please. Uh, in 2003, Les Cook's uh, British television drama History aimed to chart the entire history of British teledrama from its beginnings before the Second, uh, before the Second World War to the then present day. In doing so, he examined the problems in trying to write such a history, some of which map significantly onto my own research design. Cook acknowledged that there was a very incomplete archive of television drama material right up to the mid 1970s, when in fact my study begins, uh, and considered how this major impediment uh, might be surmounted. I quote, early British television drama might well be compared to an iceberg with a small extant amount visible while the vast majority of it will never see the light of day, surviving only in production records and in the minds of those old enough to have witnessed the original live transmission. This makes the need to record oral histories an urgent priority, and it also makes the task of preserving materials from that period an essential one." End quote. Likewise, the McTaggart lectures are the tip of an iceberg, with the majority of past festival activity surviving in scant or disparate traces, or indeed the recollections of those present. Slide, please. Uh, we are now 20 years on from Cook's research and usage of oral histories to fill archival gaps has only increased shortly thereafter and building this momentum. Slide, please. Um, Emma Sandon offered an account of the early history of BBC television through an innovative research methodology, gathering and analysing the oral histories of key personnel who worked at the BBC's Alexandra Palace studios between 1936 and 52 in Helen Wheatley's 2007 Reviewing Television History. Now, while Sandon's research aims differ from my own, she provided a valuable discussion of the shifting nature of oral methodologies and how they might be utilized in constructing television histories. Crucially, how oral history uh, work has become influenced by ideas that draw on psychoanalytical and narrative theories and that recognize the constructive and social nature of memory with oral histories being recognized as a process by which people create their sense of collective and individual identities. As researcher, it's key to be aware of how the histories take account of issues of nostalgia, pride and self-justification, sorrow and regret. Through my early oral history research, I've encountered how closely recollections of McTaggart lectures and festival work are tied to identity because the lections, the le the lectures function in effect as the keynotes of British broadcasting. They are highly significant instances in participants' careers, tied closely to Sandon's nominated issues of nostalgia, pride and self-justification. Examining these conversations in terms of how interviewees make sense of and narrativize past lectures and festivals from a contemporary standpoint in relation to surviving traces thereof will be a fascinating and fruitful constitutive element of my analysis. And final slide, please. Very brief closing note, uh, this paper has sought to overview the challenges of using historical television and festival archives in relation to my specific case study of the Edinburgh International Television Festival. Thank you for listening and thanks for having me. Thank you, Matthew. And as someone who's also researching British television history, it's fascinating learning your experiences of accessing archives because challenging is one word for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, and again, we'll come back to you later in Q&A.
And Spiros, thank you for being so patient and over to you. Thank you. Hello again. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, the internet is consistently been training me today, but I'm still very happy to be here with you. And before I start, I would like to thank Elke for allowing me to present on a different day because I had been sick with COVID over the past few weeks, but now I have fully recovered. And I also want to thank you for showing the presentation for you. So um, today I'll be sharing some of my ongoing work on Greek television. This is still under construction, so any feedback is more than welcome. And uh, I will start that, uh, in my experience, speaking in front of international audiences about television programs produced by a small nation can be quite tricky because, in a way, uh, Anglophone television uh, tends to be the canon, so usually discussions are quite often focused around uh, American and British television. Uh, and also because, because of this uh, non-familiarity of the content, um, context and a good understanding of the medium's national particularities are required before delving uh, into specific case studies. So this is what I will try to do here. First, I will begin with a brief account of the history of Greek television comedy and its resilient cultural presence in the Greek public sphere. And then uh, I will shift my attention to the reception of comedies by media scholars and the under-researched voices of television fans and online users. Uh, can we please move to the next slide? Thank you. It can be argued that Greek television comedy constitutes one of the most privileged and uh, enduring genres of national production with a history which goes in parallel with that of the broader medium. For starters, television broadcasting in Greece began in 1966 Although the military dictatorship took control of this newly founded medium almost immediately, that was only a year after its advent, television comedies uh, continued to appear, serving the dictatorship's ideological goal of entertaining audiences in a neutral way. Between 1974 and 1981, television comedy suffered a slump and was partly overshadowed by the more serious genre of television drama. The period between 1982 and 1988 saw a dramatic decline in the evolution of Greek fiction television due to the government's focus on emphasizing television's pedagogical mission by limiting the availability of entertainment and live themed programs. Beginning in 1989, however, television underwent significant changes and entered what media critics and journalists refer to retrospectively as its golden age. This means that uh, the monopoly of public television was once and for all abolished, and at the same time, the establishment of private television channels, as well as their willingness to revitalize the audiovisual landscape led them to invest heavily in comedies and situation comedies, which are now considered classics. Um, I tend to disagree with the term classics because it does create inclusions and exclusions. So in my PhD, what I tried to do was to opt for a different term, which is still a category. Uh, so I call these um, very popular comedies resilient because I think that this is a term which is quite revealing of the text characteristics, but cultural impact at the same time. So the, can we go to the next slide? Um, the resilient comedies uh, I talk about were made and first seen in the 1990s, and they are named as such because they retain a strong cultural presence for a number of reasons. Aside from occasional television reruns, many of these shows are available on DVD. They can be watched uh, on the channel's web TVs and continue to be discussed on the show's official Facebook pages and other media outlets. Yet, despite their popularity, Greek comedy television texts exhibit characteristics which are common to small nation television programming. According to media scholar Vasilis Vambakas, Greek television represents a persistently introverted medium whose production and consumption do not travel outside the country. 
um, drawing on Van der Kaas, I would like to further contend that this introversion is perceptible even within national borders and is reflected in the way that local academia chooses to examine some aspects of Greek television and employ specific methodologies. Indeed, although the study of Greek fiction television is rapidly growing, most of the work produced so far tends to prioritize text-centric approaches and researcher analysis of the television texts. As a result, the responses of real audiences and research subjects to television comedy is severely limited. So what I will try to do in this presentation, I will try to move away from questions of representation and hypothetical viewership and instead focus on ethnographic findings. To this end, I will provide a qualitative analysis of posts published by online users on YouTube channels. By carefully analyzing these posts, I aim to analyze how past texts are being brought back to the surface. By focusing on what Rubinstein defined as amateur history, it is possible to consider the ways in which shows from the past are passed down to different interpretive communities of fans, becoming subjects of critique, nostalgic remembrance, and even disputes in the present. And uh, I choose YouTube over Twitter or Facebook fan pages based on two criteria. Uh, basically here I write that these are three. So firstly, YouTube videos in the absence of specific word limits allow users to express themselves freely. Secondly, many YouTube videos uploaded by fans of specific television communities have been available for more than a decade, attracting a large number of posts from different online users during different time periods. At the same time, uh, the very fact that these videos have been circulating on the web without the permission of the creators and television channels renders them illegal, and this is something that will be quite useful later in our discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with that in mind, the sitcom I chose to examine in terms of its reception is called The Unbearables, and um, if you think about it, it's as famous as Friends. So it would be the equivalent of Friends before Friends in Greece. Uh, the Unbearables is widely regarded as a television text that broke barriers by delving into thorny societal issues. It explored, among other things, Greek exceptionalism, nationalist fantasies and politics, xenomania and xenophobia, as well as shifting gender and sexual norms prevalent in Greece during the early 1990s. However, it is primarily remembered as the first situation comedy in Greek private television to feature a gay protagonist. Next slide, please. The ways in which the show portrays the homosexual character have piqued the interests of scholars and television critics who wish to decode the show's representational politics. So, in a way, the reviews are mainly focused around uh, the gay character, who, unlike the rest of the characters, uh, is, not, is neither married nor sexually active. So, Yanis' depiction in his effeminacy and singleness has elicited responses ranging from mildly positive to overly negative. Next slide, please. Looking at online comments under episodes of The Unbearables on YouTube also reveals an emphasis on the sitcom's characters. According to Stafford, characters are more often than not the most important and stable element of a situation comedy, since their stereotypical traits serve as the foundation upon which the punchlines and the situation itself are built. Indeed, while some users take a macro perspective and discuss the sitcom characters as a collective group, so they see them as friends, the majority of users express a preference for specific characters. Indicatively, in this slide, when fans refer to the homosexual character, their comments assess the show's portrayal of homosexuality, yet step beyond it. Aside from occasional trolls and hate comments, online users tend to comment on the actor's physical appearance and emphasize his acting skills. Moreover, many commentators tend to repeat lines from the show 
that refer to the character's homosexuality and express their amusement. Uh, next slide, please. Furthermore, many viewers testify to being personally affected by the ways in which the one and only female protagonist of the show is being represented. Unlike previous academic work on the unbearables, which has concentrated exclusively on the homosexual character, fans engage in a discussion that sheds light on the show's conversation with feminist ideology. By emphasizing Dimitra's association with domesticity, a number of fans expose women's marginalization and unequal access to public and political space. Indeed, most interaction between fans serve to express different ways of understanding humor and stereotypes in comedies. Many users go so far as to write lengthy posts to make their point. Interestingly enough, a number of posts go beyond what Ellis Hansen has defined as moralistic politics of representation and instead analyze how the sitcom's use of misogynist humor can be interpreted as a tool for satirizing the very patriarchal structures it seems to reify. Such interpretations partly recuperate the stereotype of the naive housewife embodied by Shaw's female character and expose the sitcom's potential to blur the line between laughing at or laughing with comic portrayals. Next slide, please. Aside from the posts about the portrayal of the main protagonist, a few users were also interested in discussing the presence of secondary actors who made guest appearances in the show. An interesting example can be found in the second episode of the show, in which Petros Filipidis, a well-known and well-paid actor with a long and successful career in theater and cinema, appears in the show as a goofy police officer. Uh, can you click once more, Elke? Thank you. Attention should be drawn to the comments on this episode in relation to time. The first comment was posted 13 years ago, at the time when the actor was extremely popular among television fans and critics alike. The second and third comments were posted in 2021 and 2022, respectively, at a time when the Greek actor was being tried before a mixed jury court on charges of rape and attempted rape filed by three famous female actresses. As soon as the news of Petros Philippides' charges became public, many users flocked to the YouTube video in which Philippides appeared and left their comments. This complete transformation of comments here merits particular attention and illustrates, as Boisberg has argued elsewhere, the importance of conducting diachronic studies of interpretive communities on social media platforms to assess how audiences respond, respond to actual events that occur in real time. Next one. Thank you. Another example of different temporalities at play emerges when examining how online users associate the consumption of the unbearables with specific moments in their lives. Greece entered a second national lockdown from November 7, 2022 to November 30, 2020, and night curfews were among the preventive measures implemented by the government to slow the spread of COVID-19. It was during this period that the user began rewatching the unbearables as an antidote for staying at home, end quote. In a similar vein, under the fourth episode of the unbearables on YouTube, another user writes that they watched the show the day of their birthday, with a dozen users replying back, sending them wishes and virtual hugs for spending their birthday alone. Such examples demonstrate, as Bacon Smith has put it, that fiction creates community amongst fans. In this sense, popular texts like The Unbearables allow fans to not only exchange ideas about the shows, but also to develop a unique sense of community around their consumption. My goal in highlighting some of the differences in the way that academics and viewers respond to texts of the past is not necessarily to assess whether academics or viewers provide better or more holistic analysis, 
but rather to explore how television shows of the past are passed down to different generations of online users and become subjects of critique, remembrance, uh, nostalgic remembrance, disputes, and vehement discussion. Although the study is um, on a small scale and only reflective of those voices which were willing to express themselves online, the analysis reveals YouTube's role as an amateur historic archive or a library of amateur history. In other words, the online users' voices and their active engagement with the text as a main source or point of departure demonstrates fans' ability to reread television texts of the past and broaden their horizon of expectations. Next slide, please. And uh, I will end this presentation here by sharing some anecdotal evidence. Uh, although the qualitative analysis and categorization of online users' comments was finalized about uh, three or four months ago, I recently revisited the same YouTube links only to notice that many of these episodes which had been uploaded about a decade ago had been missing. As you can see in the slide, users wonder how come YouTube proceeded with banning videos which had been out there for so long and contained rich and funny discussions among users. The above incident showcases that such videos together with their online user comments form part of an archive which can be valuable and vulnerable to destruction at any time. Uh, such an analysis therefore suggests the need to incorporate and save the voice of the audiences from oblivion, which can not only add significant original thought concerning the reception of television fiction to the academic community, but can open up and diversify the dialogue of the wider television media methods research. And that was the end of my presentation. And I have one more slide where I thank you. Thank you very much, Biros. Thank you. It was um, really interesting to hear about um, sort of the online users and in contrast to sort of traditional reviewers and how they create a, almost like a live document in the comments rather than something static and just reassessing and rewriting history. That was, yeah, that was amazing. Thank you. OK, so we'll open up the floor to questions. If anyone would like to ask any of our speakers. Do you have anything in the chat or if someone would like to speak? Um, OK, well, while people are thinking, I might use chair's privilege and we'll go all the way back to Katie right at the very beginning. And I, I, what struck me was a really interesting comment you made about sentimentality and how it was applicable to children and did I re hear right uh, white adults you mentioned as well and that that was uh, that was very specific so I was wondering when you talked about Waterloo Sunset was that um, if it was uh, black characters if it was white characters would that not have been applicable or is it because of the context of being in the UK and having at that time a predominantly white British audience could you speak a little bit more about that? Thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I don't think that um, whether characters are children or um, privileged in various ways, um, that a text cannot be sentimental, like Bar Mitzvah is sentimental. Um, and Waterloo Sunset's, one, one of Waterloo Sunset's protagonists is a white woman. Um, and yeah, I don't think that marginalisation is a prerequisite for sentimentality. It's more that um, critics tended to associate texts with sentimentality if um, somebody, if, if they were ex experiencing a level of discomfort um, at empathising with, in empathising with um, the characters on screen. So in the case of, of Waterloo Sunset, it's interesting because the sentimentality seems to be um, kept at arm's length in in many ways because of um, the family's marginalization in terms of race and um, also act in, in kind of relationship to the um, the sex work and um, like drug use on screen as well um, but then also because of um, 
the because of grace the central um white woman in the play who's played by queenie watts like she is a she's elderly um and kind of and she's working class and she's kind of seen as like um a bit of a a bit of a burden really I think by a lot of the critics and in the way that they were talking about her um and that she should just she should just go and live with her nice middle class son who can give her everything she needs and things like that so yeah um anyway short answer to the question is um I don't think marginalization is necessary for sentimentality um but things tend to be dismissed as sentimental more frequently when there's a level of marginalization involved Thank you so much. Um, right, uh, we have a um, Christine. You've got your hand up if you'd like to. Yes, thank you. That was a really interesting, if somewhat disparate, panel. Um, uh, Matthew, I wanted to ask you. Tomorrow we have a discussion. A panel. The final panel is about television studies and its invisibility and its position in the hierarchy of of various media studies. I wondered if you felt that the, that film festivals had received more attention because uh, scholars are less concerned generally with television or whether there are other reasons for the disparity. I think it's it's sort of a, a, a vicious circle there, isn't it? Really, um, a lot of the mm, so the the academic attention paid to film festivals and television festivals is is disparate for a lot of reasons. And television festivals are simply very few in number globally, um, and in terms of uh, the the trade and press attention they garner, there's just a lot less. Uh, focus on them, particularly because, as I said in the presentation, a lot of them are essentially trade events. Uh, Edinburgh itself, whilst it is one of, if not the most uh, known uh, television festival, even that is only a recent trend. Um, recent, uh, similar to what Spear was saying about YouTube comments, there's been a, a quite a recent effort to democratise the festival and open its borders a bit so it's not just a purely insider celebration uh, particularly putting it on uh, broadcasting a lot of key um sessions and the mctaggart lecture live on youtube um but the attention the function uh, and the financing of it is on a completely different level to what a lot of people would first think of as uh, spearheading film festival studies where you've got this network of the the A-list quote unquote festivals, um, which obviously are known for their red carpets and millions of pounds and yacht parties and everything that goes with that, which television festivals, uh, as few as they are, just do not attempt to do and do not particularly want to do either. Thank you, Matthew. And Katie, you've got your hand up. Yep. Um, I was just, I had a question for Spiros. Um, I found it really interesting the, looking at the, the timeline of um, the, like kind of how socio-political activity impacted um, the relationship between how television in Greece was seen in relationship to um, the kind of possibility for pedagogy um, I noticed that the timeline stopped in the early 2000s and I was just going to wonder um, how you kind of perceive the situation to be currently in terms of whether there's any kind of, if, whether there's a perception of scope for um, pedagogical television now. Thank you very much for your question. Um, uh, I, I consider, and based on my readings, that the case of Greek television is a quite unique case in the sense that by the time that it started broadcasting, it was connected with, uh, with the, the dictatorship. The most interesting aspect, however, is that comedies had always been there. So it was part of the, of the government's uh, intention to keep comedies as a distraction, as a way to make people, you know, uh, what something passively uh, and neutral and don't think about other things. 
so basically your question is very interesting because 1989 is an important date because it's a privatization of television. So we have the explosion and the creation of different uh, private TV channels. Uh, since then, um, I think another important date is 2016, where you know uh, we begin to have web TVs. It's uh, also the advent of SVODs, Netflix, and other subscription channels. Um, but um, at the moment, I could say that uh, the 1990s and 2000s are the two decades which are characterized as the, as the golden age for television comedy. So we have uh, a lot of production and uh, diverse uh, comedies with uh, daring content, even at times. Thank you, Spiros. And um, Matthew, you have a question. I'm very conscious, Elke, that we're slightly over, but should we have one more question? Because I know we've got another session at 12. Yeah. Yes, one more question, I think. OK, go for it, Matthew. Sure, I had a quick question for Jen, um, I, whose talk on Saved by the Bell I really loved, uh, and just relating it to my own experience. The, uh, I was, I think I was just after the Saved by the Bell generation, really, so it wasn't part of my sort of teenagehood, but I still, and I, to this day, I think there are satellite channels, which I think um, Jen was just about, well, referenced briefly, and I don't know where your research ends, but channels like E4 and ITV2 still seem to be maintaining that uh, that system of importing American teen or now young adult works and using that to fill their schedules in a, um, a financially efficient manner. And I wondered if you'd, your research was extending more into that uh, contemporary space as well. If Jen is still here. No, Jen has had to leave, unfortunately. Oh, no. Oh, oh, never mind. I'll email her, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, am I allowed to ask a question quickly? Yes, please. Um, yes, which, so. <laughs> which, which is about, um, well, the thing that all of you um, shared was, was that you are taking very unusual approaches to uncovering the historical context. And um, I was wondering if you wanted to say something about what you think you you are uncovering as a result, rather than you know using the traditional approach of well, this is the politics of the time, this is the society of the time. So, so you're looking at sentimentality and criticism. You're looking at um, you know the, the, the industry celebratory or not so celebratory discourses, and you're looking at changing audience perceptions. I think they're all really interesting. But what what does that give you that a normal historical approach wouldn't give you? Do you think? I think that um, I think that it shows a kind of well, first, like on a most surface level um, kind of way of thinking about it. I think it reveals like a real media illiteracy in terms of reading these texts um, that was evidenced by um, basically across the board from um, critics of the time to like um, remembrances of life today, and also f even from people that were involved in in making. Um, the, the plays themselves, um, like not not in a disparaging way, just that like we like new conceptualizations can unlock new meanings. I think, um, but I also think that thinking through sentimentality in this way um, really allows for a kind of, um, I guess, like ability to understand what is happening in a. Um, in between um, something emotional happening on screen that leads to a sort of um, empathizing with characters and between making the like and between kind of like coming to conclusions about the text themes and narrative and um, there being this kind of like intermediary aspect between um, something which is strongly felt um, and and things which are kind of more reflected on. And I think the relationship between those things is really understudied. Um, I also think more kind of attention to the way that sentimentality can be used effectively in television um, will 
um, will kind of have a, a effect on um, future television being um, like kind of taking this more seriously and thinking about how things like solidarity um, and relating to um, characters with very different experiences um, to us can be kind of like a really useful social tool and that like actually invoking these emotions not directly through um, something central to the narrative but actually through something kind of seen as surplus can actually really increase depth um, of a text and kind of supplement the understanding of some of the more um, I guess mm, like didactic or um, straightforwardly political aspect of the, of, the, of the play. I hope that answers your question, sorry. Uh, could, I, could I answer the question as well? Thank you, thank you very much, it's very interesting. Uh, I would like to say that I don't think I follow a strictly historical um, examination of the text. I, I try to employ what John Ellis has named as imminent reading. So in a way, I try to reinterpret historical texts through modern optic, because we should take into account that this text in question had been made and seen in 1991. So YouTube comments and YouTube had not been uh, available at that time, I think. Uh, so basically, that's one thing. And the second thing is that um, although, you know, I don't try to show who did it best, if it was the researchers or the audiences, some observation can be made. And what I can see is that, uh, in a way, um, audiences try to step away from thumbs up, thumbs down approaches. They try, you know, they're engaged and active readers, and they try to excavate and mine and interpret the text in their own ways, you know, based on their own uh, affective uh, emotions and their relationship with the text. So I would say that what strikes me is that audiences can actually understand those gray areas which are available in comedy. So they take into serious consideration the genre's conventions, the double entendres, the ambiguities, and uh, I would further say that they seem to be in line with uh, the Anglophone research taking place at the moment. So what Rosie White, what Tyson Park or Richard Dillon have said about uh, the queer aspects of comedy. So that's what I have, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Matthew, do you want to add to that? Oh. I think we're well enough over time now, aren't we? I'm, I'm good to call it a day. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thought I'd just give you the opportunity as well. Thank and you. Um, can I just say thank you so much to all our speakers, Jen's off and all, but Matthew, Spiros, and Katie. Thank you for a wonderful morning of papers. It was so interesting.